Seekers, and that was Who Knows from the band of Gypsies, Jimi Hendrix. And I wanted to say thank you to the Kayo Toy Company of Melbourne, Australia, for sending me this cool Godzilla Buddha, Zenzilla. And I'll put their uh, email, or no, no, their URL on the screen, Kayo Toy Company. They make these nice Godzilla Buddhas, and you can get one for yourself if you want to from them. So thank you for sending me that. And I'm on my way to Las Vegas in a little bit, so I don't have time to make a video today. So I'm going to present you an, an oldie from uh, this year's tour of Europe. This is when I was in England, in Hebden Bridge. And I'm talking about Nishijima Roshi's concept of first and second enlightenment. So enjoy it, and here you go, and we'll see you next week. So there was something that came up yesterday that we were talking about. I uh, was wondering if you could just expand on a bit. And I, forgive me if I've misunderstood it. <laughs> so yeah, well, misunderstanding is fine, yeah. Okay. So you talked about the two lineages of Zen. Two lineages of Zen, yeah. Um, so the, the, not the Soto Zen, the other lineage. Rinzai, probably. The practitioners, uh, the people who practice there, are sometimes get more spiritual, more spiritual um, experiences. Experiences, yeah. Uh, with his, but with the Soto Zen, they're not as, not as many, but they're more profound, or? Yeah. Could you just explain a bit why you think that might be the case? <laughs> yeah, well, saying, saying so will make me sound a bit sectarian, but I'll, I'll try to do it anyway. Um, I have never... I've never really practiced in Rinzai-style Zen. And I'm aware, uh, now that I've done Dokusan that uh, there's some people who have in this room, so I'm I'm uh, walking on eggshells a bit. I don't want to offend anybody. So, but um, at the risk of being offensive, I'll say what I what I do know about um, about that. The the tendency in the in the Rinzai lineage is to place value on what are called satori uh, experience or, or kensho and satori is actually a fairly is is a noun nounization is taking a a fairly common japanese verb and turning it into a noun and the the verb is satoru and to satoru something in japanese is to realize something and when you turn it into a noun and put it in a Zen context, it makes it more highfalutin and um, means to realize uh, the nature of reality. And Kensho is uh, Kensho is also used in the Rinzai tradition, but 
and tends to be used sometimes in the Soto tradition too. And it ken is to see, and sho is nature, so to, to see the true nature of things. But it is generally regarded as an experience that happens. Uh, and uh, there are thought to be ways of hastening this experience along, to, to make it happen. Uh, and the way you do this, and again, I'm saying this as an outsider who is not part of the tradition, uh, would be to provide a very intense sort of practice where, uh, for example, you're given a koan to concentrate on, like a very, these very difficult questions that are, that are, that are hard to answer, uh, impossible to answer, some would say. You know, the, the stereotypical one is, uh, um, what is the sound, or what is the sound of one hand clapping, actually? Some people say it's, what is the sound of one hand? Um, what is the shape, actually, this is part of the quotation I, I thought about giving you. Uh, what is the shape of your face before your parents were born? Uh, the koan mu, which is, um, does a dog have Buddha nature? And the answer is mu, and mu means nothingness, or, or basically no. Um, but the joke of that one is the uh, original pronunciation of mu is the way the Japanese pronounce it, pronounce it but uh, apparently in the past the Chinese pronounced it something more like wu, which is more like wu. Sounds like a dog. Um, <laughs> So the answer to, to does the dog have food in nature is who? Um, so it's a bit of a joke. Um, so, so you're supposed to work on these impossible questions. I think the description is like you have an, you've swallowed a hot iron ball and it's in the pit of your stomach and you're supposed to be very intense. And the situation is set up so that you are, instead of, the, the sort of dokusan that we're doing, you have this uh, roughly, anal I don't know if it's analogous, but you have a situation, you have a, a, a thing called sanzen in which a bell is rung and everybody runs to the, to the master's room and then you're supposed to answer the koan and generally the master tells you, you you got it wrong and sends you out of the room really quickly and the next person comes in and sends, sends you out of the room and sends it. I actually was, though I've not trained in this, actually was living at a center where uh, various different uh, people, including myself, ran Zen classes. And one evening I happened to be there. Um, try, I had an early morning and I was trying to get to sleep when a local Rinzai group was there in the next room doing their Mu koan. So I'm trying to get to sleep. You're hearing these people yelling, Mu! in the next room over and over, trying to impress their teacher. So I know that this, this practice is still done. Um, uh, so, so you have that, and, and often there's... A, a lot of uh, sleep deprivation involved, um, you know, getting up really, really early in the morning and going to bed really late at night or sometimes um, doing zazen all night long. So, so it's a real intensive sort of practice. Now this is not, not every Rinzai teacher does th this way, so I'm not trying to, to um, you know, tell you it's always like this. But, but so this in intensive practice is supposed to um, cause you to have a kind of a breakthrough experience. And, and often it does. Um, uh, having not had that sort of breakthrough experience, I can't tell you what it's like. Uh, my friend uh, Gento uh, has, has done that, and he lives in Vienna, and maybe you can invite him to come out to Hepton Bridge sometime and, and, uh, and give you a talk about it. He might, he might show up. He'd probably, he'd probably like it. Um, maybe he could tell you about what that's like and, and what, whether he's had those uh, breakthrough experiences himself under, that, under those conditions, because I know, I know he's done that. Um, so, so, yeah, there's, there, is, there is that, and there is a kind of... A, my, my first teacher, Tim, had done some of that training, 
And he said there is this kind of sense of a feeling like you can kind of measure your practice in in that in that way of, of training. Because the, the koans are often given as a system. So you pass this one and then you go on to the next one, you go on to the next one, so you can feel like you're making progress. Uh, the Soto tradition, which I studied in, has generally um, well, I was going to say dispensed with all that. They never, they never took it up in the first place, um, and because it was a, it, it was kind of a later thing. You can find, you can find some writings in Dogen about this, but it sort of it even postdates Dogen that um, at least that koan introspection practice postdates Dogen. Um, so uh, their way, the way in Soto of working with koans, for example, they, we do work with koans, but it's basically um, done in, in lectures, you know, a, a teacher. You can see plenty of examples of it in Shobo Genzo, uh, where Dogen will um, take, just talk through a koan uh, in, a, in a lecture. He just, he, just, he just tells you what the koan is and gives you his opinion about it. And that's, that's how he works with it. Um, as far as those those experiences are concerned, in the in the Soto tradition, what usually happens if if you come to a teacher with ha having had uh, um, one of these sort of satori or kensho experiences, what'll generally happen is the teacher will tell you, "Oh, that's nice. Forget about it. <laughs> you know, don't worry about it. That sometimes happens." Um, that's that's what my uh, my teachers did. Uh, they they weren't interested um, really. Uh, they weren't interested in pursuing it. The best you might get is like, um, okay, just keep going with your practice. That's um, that's nice. <laughs> uh, it it's it's understood that this kind of thing happens. My I, the few times I was able to get Nishijima Roshi to talk about that thing. He would say that, okay, there is, th this, this kind of thing does happen. He would say that there's first enlightenment and second enlightenment. That sitting zazen is enlightenment itself. This is the, the thing that Dogen, that's, that was sort of the, the breakthrough Dogen had that, that made him sort of that sort of was his big thing. I don't know how to. Uh, if I were writing this, I would I would spend a day trying to <laughs> describe it better than that. But um, let's just keep moving on. Um, he he studied a the only sort of Zen that was available to him, which was Rinzai, and he must have had. His writings don't tell us much about it, but he must have had those kind of breakthrough experiences in his uh, in his training because he started when he was 12 years old and he was in his 20s by the time he went to China, and he had been offered Dharma transmission, but he he turned it down because he didn't feel like he was ready. You know, he didn't he didn't rate himself as being ready for it. So he must have he must have uh, had some of those kind of experiences. And the thing that kind of turned him around was was meeting this teacher in the Soto tradition in China who told him zazen itself is enlightenment. So there's not this special experience that comes as a result of sitting zazen. The 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 sitting uh, the doing zazen is the enlightenment experience. So there isn't, there isn't this other experience that is to be had. You, you don't do the zazen to make this other experience happen. Uh, and that's, that was his, his big breakthrough, was hearing that teaching. But as I said, when I could get Nishijima Roshi talking about those sort of breakthrough experiences, he would say, okay, there is first enlightenment and second enlightenment. So yeah, sitting zazen is enlightenment itself. If you do zazen long enough, uh, for most people who do zazen long enough, there is this other enlightenment that happens. 
and he called it solving philosophical problems. And it's sort of, I wish I could remember the metaphor he used, because, because I can't. I just remember that in my mind, when he, whenever he talked about it, I always pictured what he was saying as being a bit like a roller coaster, like you're going up, 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 up the roller coaster. And at some point, there's like a tipping point, and you're going down. You know, because because there's nowhere else to go. They're just they're just you know, um, so there there's an accumulation of things, and it just kind of snaps at one moment, and then that um, that is the solving of philosophical problems. Um, now, Tim was the one who said, and this is based on him studying both in Rinzai and Soto, that he thought that in the Rinzai tradition a lot more people had so-called enlightenment experiences uh, than people in the Soto tradition, but the people in the Soto tradition tended to be fewer people had those experiences, but they were more profound. Um, I don't know if that's true. I don't, I don't know if there's any way you could, you could judge that or assess that. But I think it's, you know, Dogen has this metaphor where, he's, where he talks about it being kind of like if you go walking in, we probably have this happen a lot it, it, around here, you don't have this happen in California, in one of those rains where it's not quite rain, it's just a sort of mist. And if you walk long enough, you're, you're soaking wet and you didn't even notice you were getting wet, you know. Um, it's, it's a bit like that. Um, you know, that kind of... Uh, thing where it gradually just seeps in until until you're just um, you're just completely soaked and then you just at, at, you know at some point you go oh my god I'm just <laughs> you know soaked to the bone and I didn't even notice it uh, while it was happening uh, so it might be a bit like that uh, and for some people it's a it's a it's a profound moment that you know, happens and you can, you can put a, you can put a pin on it and go, you know, it happened on April 7th at 7 p.m. Uh, and for some people it's, it's, uh, it's just, uh, you know, you just go, you look back on it and go, oh yeah, something happened. Something like that. Hey Ziggy. Ziggy. There's Ziggy. There's a little cameo from him. He didn't want to come outside. See you next week, Diggy. <laughs>